So Sally and I will have a conversation for a while and then open the floor for questions. So you should think about questions that you might like to ask her. Um, I'm, I'm obviously delighted to welcome uh, Sally here. She is uh, truly an individual of courage and integrity and a great role model for all of us, um, one that we should uh, follow uh, when, when the occasion arises and we have to make difficult decisions. Um, this, is, this is the role model that we want to emulate. Um, so Sally grew up in Georgia where she had strong roots in the law. Um, her grandmother was one of the first women ever admitted to the Georgia bar. Um, but the times being what they were, um, no firm was willing to hire a woman lawyer and she worked instead as a legal secretary for Sally's grandfather. Um, Sally's father was also a lawyer and he served for 18 years as a judge on the Georgia Court of Appeals. Um, Sally earned her own law degree from the University of Georgia, where she graduated magna cum laude and served as executive editor of the Law Review. Um, after three years in private practice in Atlanta, uh, she was appointed an assistant United States attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. In that capacity, she prosecuted a range of cases, including white collar fraud and political corruption. She was also the lead prosecutor in the case of Eric Rudolph, who committed the Olympic Park bombing. Uh, Rudolph was a terrorist who carried out a series of fatal anti-abortion and anti-gay bombings throughout the South between 1996 and 1998. Under President George W. Bush, Sally rose to the position of acting U.S. Attorney in 2004, and six years later, under President Barack Obama, uh, she was appointed U.S. Attorney for the Northern District of Georgia. She was the first woman ever to hold that position. In 2014, Sally was appointed Deputy Attorney General of the United States, the second highest position in the Department of Justice. During a confirmation hearing, Senator Jeff Sessions, thinking at the time of President Obama, asked Sally if she would obey a president's unlawful orders. Sally responded that she would have an overriding obligation in all circumstances to follow the law and the Constitution. On January 20th, 1917, I'm sorry, 2017. <laughs> I'm not that old. <laughs> nor even as Donald Trump. Uh, on January 20th, 2017, uh, on the day Donald Trump took office, uh, Sally was appointed acting Attorney General of the United States. And 10 days later, after federal courts had stayed the implementation of President Trump's executive order on travel and immigration, um, Sally ordered the Department of Justice not to defend the travel ban in court because she was not convinced that it was lawful. Uh, in a letter to the department, she explained that as acting attorney general, she was responsible for ensuring that the positions we take in court are consistent with our solemn obligation to stand for the rule of law. President Trump then dismissed acting attorney general Yates from her position. Six months later, in a piece in the New York Times, Sally expressed her concern about Donald Trump's political influence on the Department of Justice writing that, quote, President Trump's actions appear aimed at destroying the fundamental independence of the Department of Justice. Its investigations and prosecutions must be conducted free from any political interference or influence. The very foundation of our justice system, the rule of law, depends on it. So, Sally, first of all, because students may be interested in this question in terms of their own careers, um, why did you decide to go into public service and to make that the central part of your career? Um, well, first, if I can, let me thank the Dean and all of you for inviting me to be here today. It's a real honor um, to be giving the Schwartz, would this be Schwartz conversation instead no. of lecture, uh, perhaps. And I'm really impressed that you guys have not cut out of here early and headed home for Thanksgiving <laughs> and, that, and that you're still here. So thank you. For Only that. because you're here, by the way. <laughs> um, well, actually, you know, you already pointed out that I come from a long line of lawyers. Um, as you mentioned, my grandmother, my father, both my grandfathers, you know, uncles, cousins. Um, I actually resisted the notion of being a lawyer for all of two years um, after I got out of undergraduate and then went to law school and really didn't have any notion at all that I was going to become a prosecutor or have anything to do with criminal law. I didn't even take many criminal law classes which probably would concern you given the jobs I ended up with, but um, <laughs> I went to private practice and I actually had a very good experience. I, as you mentioned, I was at King and Spalding and the work was interesting and intellectually challenging, um, but I just didn't find it terribly fulfilling in terms of feeling like I was having a real impact on the world. And so my plan had been to go to the U.S. Attorney's Office and stay a few years and then come back either to KNS or some other firm in Atlanta um, but when I got there and once I started doing these cases and 
Um, you know, I told some folks earlier this morning, you, you know, as a lawyer, your job is to represent your clients and to represent your client's interest. And sometimes they're right and sometimes they're wrong and sometimes you like them and sometimes you don't, but your job is to represent their interest. But when you are part of the Department of Justice, when you represent the people of the United States, your only responsibility is to seek justice. And I know that sounds incredibly corny, but that's really what people at DOJ believe. And that is an amazing luxury as a lawyer. And to feel like you're being able to have a positive impact on the safety of your communities and hopefully doing the job in a way that engenders the trust of the people that you're serving, you know, it doesn't get any better than that. And so while I planned on staying a couple of years, I found myself still there 27 years later. Um, after having had a variety of different positions and jobs in DOJ, doing the same thing all the time would have become somewhat boring. Um, but they were different positions, different types of cases, um, ro a role in main justice, and I've, it was I've, the greatest privilege of my life. So you invoke the rule of law. What do you mean by that? Yeah, well, you know, when people say that, a lot of people have different definitions. I look at the rule of law as sort of our basic promise as a country that the law applies equally to everyone that no one is above the law, and likewise, everyone is entitled to equal protection of the law. And that also means it's sort of what separates us from authoritarian regimes, where we don't have executives who are then using the law in a way to go after political enemies or to protect, uh, to protect themselves or friends. And that's really sort of at, at the core of our whole system of justice. So how did you make the decision not to defend Trump's travel ban? Oh, we're going to go right to that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Just, yeah. you know. <laughs> no point beating around. Okay. <laughs> um, well, you know, you mentioned that I um, that I've been asked to stay on as as acting attorney general, and it's a tradition in the Justice Department for the deputy attorney general to act as attorney general in a change in administrations. And um, you know, it's a really important thing for there to be continuity in all of our agencies, but it's particularly important at the Department of Justice, given the national security responsibilities and public safety responsibilities that you have. So I was happy to do that. Um, I love the department, wanted to help in that transition. Um, but it's also another tradition that during that time that everything stays status quo, that there's no change in positions <coughs> in cases from the prior administration, um, and the new administration doesn't haul off and have new policies, and likewise, I wouldn't as acting AG, you know, go issue some Obama-era type of policy during that time. So everything is supposed to pretty much just stay as it is um, during that time. And so um, imagine my surprise, um, to learn about Friday evening as I was heading back to Atlanta. My family home is in Atlanta um, through my principal deputy, um, Matt Axelrod, whose brother is here, um, who was, I had gone to the airport and was on my way to the plane there and Matt called me and said, you know, I just went on the New York Times website and you're not gonna believe this, but it looks like President Trump has issued some sort of travel ban. And that was the first that we had heard about. That's how we learned about it. And it was already in effect at that point. And we were going to have to have lawyers in court the next morning defending it. And so it was a very busy weekend. While we tried to get our arms around um, what the travel ban was, um, what the administration was attempting to accomplish through this, and what the parameters were, who they believed that it covered. Um, because at the time I made my decision um, you know, we're on travel ban 3.0, but on the travel ban that I made my decision on, it's, it applied still to lawful permanent residents, people with green cards, and people with valid visas. Um, no longer in, in travel ban 2 or 3 did it, but at that time it applied to those as well. And so over the weekend, I had issued a directive that people could defend the ban um, use it on procedural grounds only until we could get our arms around it and try to figure out whether we believed that it was lawful or constitutional. And people were able to do that mostly by it being mooted out when people were then admitted to the country over the course of the weekend. Um, but by Monday morning, I learned that we were going to have to take a position on the constitutionality of the executive order the next day. And we had spent the weekend reading the challenges that had been filed, reading cases, um, and I 
gathered all the folks together in my conference room that morning, being both the Trump appointees and the career DOJ officials that would be involved in the defense. And we talked through what the challenges were and what our defense to those challenges would be. And I can't disclose internal DOJ deliberations. Um, oh, come on. I can't. But, uh, no. <laughs> You're among friends here. Yeah. <laughs> cool note, right? That, um, can't do that. That's, um, but I can say that at the end of that, I wasn't satisfied that the executive order was lawful or constitutional. And even more troubling to me, it became clear to me um, over the weekend and through that discussion that to defend the ban was going to require DOJ lawyers to go into court and to argue that the travel ban had absolutely nothing to do with religion. It was completely independent of that. And based on the president's statements, others' statements, the fact that there had been no um, national security process, there had been no input from national security agencies and a variety of other factors, I didn't believe that that would be the truth. And that's what I really wrestled with there, is that I didn't think that I could send lawyers into court to defend something that wasn't grounded in the truth. That's not what the Department of Justice does. Um, so I struggled with the idea of do I resign, um, which I understand some people think would have been the more appropriate course, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's a fair point. Um, I struggled with do I resign or do I stay and direct the department not to defend something that I concluded wasn't lawful or constitutional and would not be a defense not grounded in truth. Um, and it's sort of, look, I understand reasonable people may have made a different decision, but to me, um, it would have protected my personal integrity if I had just resigned because I would not have been part of this. But my unique job as the acting attorney general was not just to protect my integrity, but also the integrity of the Department of Justice. And to have done otherwise and just resigned, I didn't feel like would be doing my job. And I did remember that confirmation hearing where it wasn't just Senator Sessions, but others who had repeatedly asked me during that of if the president asks you to do something that's unlawful or unconstitutional, will you say no? They didn't ask me, will you resign? They asked me, will you say no? And so I felt <coughs> like to do my job, I needed to say no. So that's what I did. Um, how did you know that you were going to be fired? Although you um, had been fired, I guess, actually. Well, I didn't know I would be, right. although I, you know, there certainly was a good chance that that was going to happen. <laughs> was there a discussion of that about you, this is likely to get you fired? Um, Without asking you to reveal anything? Yeah, um, certainly, yeah. We acknowledged that it was like, I mean, there was a really good chance. I mean, I'll, I'll confess to you, I held out some hope I wouldn't be fired. Um, in part, I mean, I've told Jeffrey this, I'd been with DOJ for 27 years. I didn't particularly want to end all of those years of service with getting fired um, as acting attorney general, but I knew that was a, 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 not just a distinct possibility, I knew that that was likely to happen. So how did um, you learn? Did um, Trump call you and said, you're out of here? No, no. Um, <laughs> well, I learned later that they tried to do it by email, um, but it kept bouncing back. <laughs> So, um, so I was still there. It was, you know, 9 or 10 that evening. Um, and there were, you know, during this time, I was there and I had one deputy with me from the Obama administration, but all of the other appointees were Trump administration appointees at this point. So, you know, it's sometime after 9 that evening and there's a knock on my door. And it was the knock from Matt's office, who was my principal deputy, into mine. We had adjoining offices. And I knew some, it was bad news because normally when Matt would knock on the door, it would be like a knock and he kind of comes in at the same time. I mean, we were in and out of each other's offices all day long. This time there was the knock and then the wait. And nobody's walking in. And so uh, Matt was there with a, with a Trump official to deliver the letter. And it was a letter from the president? No, no, it wasn't. It was from the head of um, presidential, uh, presidential personnel, which is all political appointees. I see. And we, we used, I, guess, I guess the answer is you weren't really surprised that this is what happened. No, I mean, no, I wasn't surprised. Um, 
I'd be less than honest if I didn't say it didn't still feel like a bit of a, you know, a punch in the gut. Right. Um, but I certainly was not surprised by that. So um, what threats do you see to the rule of law from the current administration? Um, I mean, how, how much time? <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. Go for it. Um, I, you know, it's important that, that people understand. Yeah, um, significant. Um, from my perspective. And when I talk about that, I'm not talking about policy differences. Um, you know, elections have consequences. You expect and have to anticipate that there are going to be policy changes from one administration to the next. And so while I certainly disagree with a number of the policy positions of the Department of Justice now, I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is the independence of the Department of Justice. And you know, throughout administrations, Republican and Democratic administrations, at least since Watergate, there has been a strong norm that protects the rule of law, that there is absolutely no involvement by the White House, um, or the legislative branch for that matter, but there's no involvement um, specifically by the White House in specific criminal investigations or cases. There certainly can be discussion about policies, and that's happened in both administrations, but when it comes to particular cases or investigations, it is hands off. And that's really important, both because you shouldn't have an executive that is directing you in terms of how the criminal process should be used, but it's equally important that the public have confidence that that's not how the Department of Justice is being used. Because I think our whole system falls apart when the citizens of our country lose confidence in their justice system and in their Department of Justice. And almost from the very beginning, We've seen breaches in that wall repeatedly from the White House and specifically from the President. And, you know, after the first time, I thought, well, just kind of maybe he doesn't know. And so people will explain to him that even though DOJ is part of the executive branch, that there's this important norm that the White House and specifically the President does not get involved in that. But it's happened repeatedly over and over again. Can you again. give some examples? Yeah, from. Um, going to Jim Comey, for example, and asking him to back off of the Mike Flynn investigation, um, which would have been bad enough to begin with for the President of the United States to be asking you to drop a criminal investigation, but then firing him when he didn't. Um, calling Attorney General Sessions and asking him to drop the Sheriff Arpaio um, criminal case. Um, and he, as we all know, he pardoned him then afterwards when he didn't do that. Um, repeatedly, over and over again, as recently as I believe last week, um, there's been the relentless calls to investigate his former political opponent um, over and over again for, for all sorts of different matters. Um, and even, you know, this one really troubled me too when in New York with the terrorism suspect there, before this individual had even been charged, the president had declared him guilty and that the department should be seeking the death penalty. He should be executed for this before he had even been charged. You know, this, is, then there's the, you know, the, the, the continuous calls for leak investigations. And this, I mean, that's just a, a wall um, that previously had not been breached. Or if it had been breached, there was such an uproar over it, everybody kind of got back into their lane immediately if there had been a misstep. And what I worry about is that this is happening so frequently with attempts, and I'm not suggesting by this that this means that DOJ has heeded that, um, but to me the damage is done when the attempt is made to begin with, because the attempt itself undermines the independence of the Justice Department and undermines public confidence there. And when this happens over and over so much, I worry that people start to believe that this is normal that this is how it's supposed to happen, and it's not even as so much of a thing anymore when it does happen. It, you know, when it happened initially, everybody's up in arms, and now when it happens again, when another tweet or whatever happens, then it's just kind of we move on to, to the next issue. And this isn't normal, and this is also not a partisan issue. Again, this is something that's been protected in Republican and Democratic administrations, and I think it's essential for DOJ to operate in the independent manner that it's supposed to. But should I infer from what you said that, that in fact, DOJ has um, responded appropriately to these 
requests or demands? Well, you know, I'm obviously not privy to what's going on. But to and, the extent you Yeah, aware I mean, of it. I'm, I'm encouraged by the fact that Attorney General Sessions um, recused himself from the Russia investigation. That's a good sign that, um, that my successor appointed Bob Mueller as um, a special counsel to investigate that. That's a good sign um, that Attorney General Sessions did not drop the Sheriff Arpaio mm -hmm. investigation. That's good too. Um, so I, I don't have any indication that they have heeded um, the request from the White House. I don't, you know, I'm not privy again to what's going on. You don't know what you don't know. Right. Um, but so far, at least from the outside, I would say it looks like they are resisting. That's good to know. They probably wouldn't want to use that word resisting, but it looks <laughs> like that. <laughs> so you mentioned Bob Mueller. I mean, mm -hmm. what, is, what are your thoughts about, about Mueller and, and the investigation? Yeah. I've known Bob Mueller for a long time, and I will tell you, as a country, I think we ought to feel really good that Bob Mueller is the guy that's in charge of this. Um, you know, Bob is a just the facts man kind of guy. He is going to call it down the middle. Um, he's not going to be influenced by any tweets or pressure on him. But likewise, I would say, and we all ought to also take confidence in this, I don't think he's going to try to drum up a case that doesn't exist to, to justify his existence either. And as citizens, that's also what we should want. We should want him to call it straight, just like it is. And um, I think he'll do that. Now, I don't think, though, that we, one of the things that worries me a little bit when there's a whole lot of focus on the special counsel's investigation, and understandably so, I don't think that's the answer, though, to whether bad stuff happened. I think we already know that norms were violated and bad things happened that we ought to not want to repeat in the future. Um, and so I don't think that we ought to look to whether or not Bob Mueller decides that there's proof beyond a reasonable doubt that a felony was committed as sort of our litmus test as to whether everything is okay um, because things happened that were not okay. But I think we should use that information going forward to ensure that this type of interference doesn't happen again. You think there's a risk at some point that Trump might fire Mueller? Um, I'm probably not the best person to predict what President <laughs> Trump might do. <laughs> Although I did see it as like, um, you know, you gotta hope not. I think he's certainly gotten the signals from people on both sides of the aisle that that would be a really, I mean, catastrophic is a strong word, but that would be a really um, bad thing for our country if he were to do that. And he's heard that from many Republicans have sent him that public message that that would be a bad thing. So I would certainly hope that that wouldn't happen, but I don't know that there's any way to really accurately predict mm -hmm. what might happen. So um, you, you obviously have had an extraordinary career in public service, um, and I imagine that there are students here today who came to law school uh, assuming they would do public service, wanting to do public service, yeah. um, particularly with government, um, but for many of them who see themselves as not particularly sympathetic to the current president, um, what advice would you give them about taking positions in the government today? You know, it's interesting. Um, um, this is the question I get asked most frequently. I've been speaking to a lot of colleges and law schools, and um, literally I am asked this question every time, so you would think I would have a good answer to it by now, <laughs> um, which I really don't because it's a difficult question. The first thing I would tell you is that to me, one of the great tragedies out of this administration would be if we have a change in the call to public service, and particularly bright young people coming out of colleges and law schools wanting to go into public service. I would encourage you to still consider it and to still go um, for this reason. Much of the work of government, even much of the work of DOJ, doesn't really change from one administration to the next. Now, if you are a strong believer in the aggressive enforcement of voting rights work or other things, you might not want to go to the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice right now. You may want to pick where it is that you would go. But gosh, it's really important that we continue to have people who are willing to serve. I actually believe we all have an obligation to do some type of public service sometime in our lives. And your government needs you. There also needs to be a diversity of viewpoints, I think, among the career employees of our government. 
I mean, that's the reason why like 99.9% .9 of DOJ, for example, they're career folks. They don't change. You don't want those career people to be all of one political persuasion or the other. You want that mix of people there. So that's how you get the best decisions and the best ideas. And so I think it would be really damaging to our government, not just during this administration, but going forward, if, if people lost that call to public service. Now, I understand, though, that you might not, again, want to go into a particular area where you might be called upon to um, carry out policies that you believe are just wrong. Not just not wise, but wrong. And so I think you have to choose wisely about where you go. But I would absolutely encourage you to still go. This, the administration needs you. So speaking of the call to public service, um, what's next for Sally Yates? People talk about you as a possible governor of Georgia. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm not, um, I don't see running for office. Um, and I do get asked this a lot. Um, and I do believe in public service, and I hope maybe one day I'll have an opportunity for some type of public service again. But I've never really felt drawn to the sort of whole electoral process thing, the running for office. And I think most people who do that, we were talking about, that most people have kind of always wanted to run for office, the people who do. I, I don't feel that. Um, I feel, again, drawn to public service, but not necessarily elected office. So how do you imagine the next several years? Um, well, right now, I'm at Georgetown Law School and visiting there and having a terrific time there and doing a lot of public speaking. I'm probably going to, it'll end up being some combination of the practice of law because I actually really like being a lawyer and I don't want to get completely away in some other field that you could do even if you weren't a lawyer. Um, I enjoy the practice, so a combination of practice along with um, some of the issues that I really care about, what I consider sort of social justice issues, criminal justice reform issues and, and other issues, some combination of that with some speaking and um, using what, I didn't plan on having this voice, whatever it is that I have right now, um, and I don't want to overinflate what this voice might be, but I've got it now, um, and I feel like it's important to use it responsibly for issues that I care about, and so I want to make sure that whatever I do protects the ability to be able to use that and, and target it, and, you know, not to be out there commenting on everything every day, um, but to be able to push in the areas that I think are really important in our country now. So I know one of those areas you, you, you're concerned about is criminal justice reform. Mm -hmm. So what are the concerns that you have about the current state of the criminal justice system? Um, wow, that would take sort of the rest of our time here. But that is something actually that I was re had been really involved in um, that grew out of my experience as an AUSA and then as U.S. attorney, sort of bottom line. When we talk about criminal justice reform, that can include a whole variety of issues. It's everything from how we address mental health to over-incarceration to prison reform um, and work that we do there, to um, alternatives to incarceration. You know, there's a whole wide range, but sort of at its core, I think we have a serious over-incarceration problem in our country right now that really grows out of our policies from the 80s and 90s and how we were addressing um, drug trafficking, both in the states and in the federal system. And as a result of that, um, our prison population has exploded, for example, on the, on the federal side, 800% just since the 1980s. Um, we're spending between a fourth and a third of the entire DOJ budget now just on BOP. Um, and we have BOP is Bureau, Bureau of Prisons, Prisons, I'm sorry, which is all part of DOJ, um, which is having, a, I believe, a really negative impact on public safety because it is drawing resources away from being able to, to go after the most serious crimes and also to invest in prevention and prisoner reentry, which is essential for safe communities. And we also, I believe, are undermining the, the public's perception of the fairness of our criminal justice system by having too many people in prison who are serving sentences that are longer than necessary for public safety reasons. Um, and particularly when you look at the racial um, impact, um, particularly through like crack powder ratios and other issues that came up in the 80s and 90s in response to mandatory minimums, um, when you look at the, at the, um, at the impact on um, particularly African Americans in our country, it's essential to me that we try to adjust that. And we were doing that. We didn't get sentencing reform through in the Obama administration, despite a lot of push. We couldn't get a vote on the Senate floor, even though I'm told we had the votes, because it's actually one of the few issues out there in which there is bipartisan agreement 
of the need for criminal justice reform. You know, a lot of red states and blue states alike are, are doing it all over the country. Um, sometimes it's for fiscal reasons because there's a recognition that we simply can't afford to continue to incarcerate at this rate. Others look at it from a social justice and fairness perspective. I don't particularly care what gets you there. Um, it's the fact that people are getting there from both ends of the spectrum. And so my hope is, is that even though there's a very different perspective on that from Attorney General Sessions, that this is firmly rooted enough in the states right now that that work will continue um, even if there's not really leadership at DOJ on it. Why don't we open up the questions from the audience? Yes. You spoke briefly about the Russian interference in the 2016 elections. Can you talk about what you think are the most important issues for the U.S. to address in the coming 2018 and 2020 elections to prevent similar issues in the future? Yeah, you know, if I um, had the answer to that, I probably um, there are a couple of things. One, um, one of the things that we started in the last administration that I think they really need to be focusing on now, and maybe they are and we're just not hearing about it very much, is shoring up our state um, election systems, particularly our computer systems there. We found that the Russians had infiltrated and were getting into various parts of the election system in the states, not into vote tallying, no evidence that they actually impacted that, but rather voter registration rolls and all that they were um, messing around in there. It would be crazy for us to assume that their capabilities are frozen at where they were in 2016 and that that's all they're going to be able to do. And so I think that we should be putting our best computer minds on that as well and working with our states not to see this as a partisan issue, but to see this as something that we all should care about, Democrats, Republicans, independents alike, in protecting our election systems. Secondly, I think it's educating the public, but sometimes in terms of, of the news that they're getting may not be actual news. And I know there's lots of discussions of fake news and what is that now, but um, when, we, um, when you see the infiltration that the Russians had through Facebook, through Twitter, through, um, through other mechanisms on social media to be able to spread information that's just plain made up, um, there's no way to measure what impact, and I'm not suggesting to you that through the election, I, you know, I, I'm not saying that, um, but when you start aggregating a lot of this, we don't really have any way of knowing what either impacted in the past or what could impact in the future, so certainly those two things. And I also personally think it's really important we be very clear to the Russians, we know it was them. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, how's it going? <coughs> My bad. As an Arab Muslim immigrant, you know, I just want to thank you for taking the stance you did. Um, your courage was really inspiring, and it you know, let our community know that there were still principled people willing to take a stance for things. So really, thank you for that. Um, my question is about a, um, a decision made, I guess, before you joined the, the Department of Justice. Um, Eric Holder, in 2013, said that he was going to look into NYPD surveillance programs of Muslims uh, in New York. And I know that program ended up being a pilot for countering violence. Really, extremism programs around the country, which we know is a big problem because you know Trump actually wanted to change that, those programs specifically countering violent Islamic extremism. And so I was wondering what happened at that speech because um, obviously Trump's ban was you know brash and terrible on its face and was you know drastic difference from anything that came before, but it was also built on you know policies that had come before that were discriminatory or mm -hmm. you know were you know morally reprehensible. So we need to I was wondering why that didn't ever go yeah, I don't know the answer to your question. I joined um, Maine Justice after that, and I don't know what the answer to that is or whether they did look into it and gave an answer back to someone. I don't know. I can tell you outside the confines of that specific, specific instance, you know, that is something that DOJ worked with DHS and FBI about a lot, and it's, you know, it's a tricky balance there in finding how you're going to address national security and ensure that you are developing um, the information that you need to be able to identify any terror plots before they take place at the same time that you're not engaging in profiling um, and that you're not um, furthering a lot of the misconceptions um, that may exist out there. And I'm not going to pretend to you even during my time there that we always got that balance right because I don't think we did. Um, but I can tell you that people were trying really hard 
um, from what I know, both at FBI, not just at Maine Justice, but at FBI as well, to try to strike that balance. And I'm sorry I don't have the answer to your specific question. So when you're, this question is more about kind of your time as a frontline prosecutor. So yeah. when there was a- It's a great job. I highly encourage you all to become AUSAs. Yeah. Was there ever a time where that there was a for policy reason or you know, mandate of a certain U.S. attorney or DOJ Maine that there were cases being brought that you had to prosecute that you felt for policy reasons or ethical reasons that really shouldn't be prosecuted? And how did you deal with those conflicts? No, I didn't. Um, and that to me is one of the great things about being an AUSA. If you don't believe not only that the person is guilty, because that's just the first threshold, but that it's right and fair and just for them to be prosecuted, you don't bring that case. Now, there could be people, for example, who um, were philosophically opposed to the death penalty, and we might have a death penalty case. That doesn't mean because there's an AUSA who's opposed to it that the office doesn't do it, but you would never put somebody on a case where they were, were philosophically opposed to that. Um, now, that being said, I didn't do a lot of drug work when I was in AUSA. I was in the white collar area and did a lot of public corruption work. Um, but during the time that I was in AUSA, there was the Ashcroft policy um, that's sort of similar but had more flexibility than the policy right now. Um, if I had been a drug prosecutor then, I might have struggled a bit more um, because it was one that didn't provide a lot of discretion with respect to mandatory minimums, um, which is different than what the Holder policy did later during the Obama administration. But no, to me, that's one of the great things about DOJ is that you believe every single time that you're on the right side. Not everybody's going to agree with you about whether you're on the right side, but you believe it every single time. Come on, I'll call on you. Don't be shy. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, you. Um, well, first, uh, <laughs> I want to thank you on behalf of many of the women in my life for standing up and using your voice um, to defend the rule of law. That must have been, you know, many of us would imagine it as scary. So thank you for setting that example in line with Professor Stone's comments on being a role model. Um, you spoke earlier about the fraying of legal norms under this administration, and I'm just wondering how we as future lawyers can help um, repair what has been frayed and how you envision um, that process sort of moving forward. Yeah, you know, um, I wish I had a great answer for that. Um, part of it is, and I know this is going to sound kind of silly, is um, to continue to remind people that what's happening now isn't normal. And that doesn't mean you necessarily have to go write a New York Times op-ed, or but just sort of in general conversation with people who aren't lawyers particularly, that this isn't normal. I'm not saying you have to become a nag about it and that you know, you're constantly talking about this, but I think part of it is if you're not a lawyer, and particularly if you are not steeped in DOJ, you don't know that the president should not be directing the Department of Justice who to prosecute or who not to prosecute. Um, Secondly, I guess I would say, you know, one of the things that I've been really encouraged about um, is how many young people, particularly young women, are getting involved now. I mean, I can't tell you the number of young women who have come up to me and told me they're running for office or, you know, they went to um, a town hall of an elected official to tell them about what they thought about X, Y, or Z. Um, I think it's really important that our elected officials, senators, congressmen, continue to know that this kind of thing is troubling. Um, and this is not how it's supposed to operate, and that we continue to respond to it and not just become numb to it. It's kind of hard outside of that for somebody who's not part of the system to be able to impact it, I think. Yes. For me? Oh, um, just two things. The first thing is I have some family in Atlanta that would vote for you if you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank them for that. <laughs> um, and that, you know, as, as you speak about, um, more women are, are, are running for office. So that's another reason that I think that you should. And I would encourage you. <laughs> I would encourage you. The second thing is. I think I'm getting guilted here, but I'm not <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, well, also on, on that point, more people who don't want to run for office should run for office because they think you would bring that integrity that's not that doesn't bring the ego with it. But some in a moment where you had to make a decision of what's right and what's wrong and use your judgment, 
um, I think that is what would be very valuable, um, which is why you should run. <laughs> You've got a campaign you. chairman already. <laughs> Family in Georgia, what more could I ask for? <laughs> Well, the second part is how would you advise us as lawyers in training when we would have to, um, we may encounter similar situations, but not have the, the power to have an impact the way that, the way that you had to, um, to really bring attention to something or, or affect the type of change. You know, it, as a first year associate at a law firm or a first year out of school at the DOJ or in a public interest um, firm, how, how do we make the decision when it's time to, to stand up and say something or when we need to, I, I hate to say it this way, but go with the flow because we don't have any power. <laughs> You know, I would encourage you when, particularly when you see something happening that you feel like is wrong, um, and that's different now from something that you just don't think will be very effective, but something that you think is wrong to speak up. I remember when I was U.S. Attorney in Atlanta, and we would have what we called indictment review committees, and we would always make sure that we had new AUSAs that were part of this committee. And in part, it was for training. You wanted them to see how the office would wrestle with difficult cases. But also because my thought was is I wanted some of those new, fresh minds to be looking at this that hadn't gotten so steeped in being a prosecutor that they weren't able to kind of zoom out and to see it from a broader perspective. So your voice, your perspective, your sense of what's right and wrong there can be really important even when you're speaking to someone who has a whole lot more experience than you. Now, I get that you don't walk in sort of the first day and start telling your boss in a law firm about how wrong they are, how morally wrong they are. You know, to be doing that might be a pretty short tenure you might have there. But you develop, I mean, people that you trust in ways to do it. Um, I remember when I was at King and Spalding, and it wasn't really so much over right, wrong, moral issues, but um, there was this partner there that just, God, he couldn't get out of his own way. I mean, he just, it seemed like every direction he would go, it was like to be the jerk on the case. And I didn't have the ability as a you know, second year associate then to be able to tell him not to do it. But I did enlist another junior partner and, and convinced him to come onto this case with us. And I could talk to him and get him then to talk to the more senior partner because I knew that my voice wasn't just directly to the more senior guy, wasn't going to be all that. Pro there are ways, and I know this probably isn't really helping you very much now, but you know, there are ways that you can find to speak out. I think you have to pick and choose your battles um, in terms of whether it could be that they do know more than you about how this ought to happen. So you want to, I think, certainly um, be deferential to the fact that you don't have the same experience they do but you've got a strong gut and a compass. And that fresh perspective can be really helpful if you can find a way to convey it in a respectful way. And then if it's something that's so bad, um, you have to decide whether that means that you go do something else. Yes. Um, as a female prosecutor, do you ever experience uh, sexism throughout you know, any time in your career? Uh, how did you handle that? And then what advice did you Yeah, well, things have changed dramatically since when I first started as a lawyer. Um, when I started at King & Spaulding, there was only one female litigation partner in the entire firm. So that tells you, and when I came to the U.S. Attorney's Office, in Atlanta, this was before there were many people in big firms that were going to the U.S. Attorney's Office, and I was one of the first to do that. I remember sitting down with the Fauza, the first assistant, the, the chief um, um, career um, lawyer in the office, and. I had wanted to go to the organized crime section at that point because I had a friend who was in that and it sounded completely different from what I did at King and & Spaulding and thought it would be interesting and so I wanted to go to organized crime. Um, the Fauza there told me he didn't think I should go to organized crime, that there are a lot of unseemly people I would be dealing with there and they're kind of rough and tumble and you coming from the silk stocking firm, you know, that's probably not the best place for you. Um, he wasn't intending to be sexist in that, um, but clearly he was being quite paternalistic. I hate to admit it turned out 
that he made the best decision in the world for me because I went to white collar and I loved it. <laughs> and so it ended up being the best place. But the reasons he made that decision weren't right. Um, I re also recall early on trying cases. And um, this was sort of at the height of what I would call the mommy wars, which you all may or may not be familiar. It's, it was sort of the tension that existed between women who worked outside the home and women who did not. And I can remember starting, you know, picking the jury and being more nervous about how the women on the jury would accept me than how the men would. Because, and it sort of intentionally wanting to get across to the women that were on there that I'm married, I've got a family, I'm kind of, I'm like you, um, that, that there was, that, you know, none of that really exists now. I mean, I know there's still some tension between working women and non-working women, but it's changed dramatically now to the point where when I was at Maine Justice and I was leaving a meeting in the Attorney General's conference room, Attorney General was Loretta Lynch, and my principal deputy, Matt, was next to me, and at the end of the meeting he said, and this you know, table is all filled um, with principals from the department and assistants and the, you know, all along the lines of the walls um, is it, all filled with people there. And when we're getting up, Matt turned to me and said, did you realize I was the only man in the room for this? <laughs> and actually, I hadn't even noticed that, which I think is a really good sign, not only that Matt was the only man in the room, but the fact that that hadn't even dawned on me in that yeah, time. That's so. interesting. Yes? Well, you talked a little bit about how the war on drugs and mass incarceration are inextricably linked. I was just wondering if you think decriminalization is feasible, and if not, how can we address the war on drugs in a manner that doesn't involve decriminalization? Yeah, I think they are linked. I mean, I think if you look at the data, you see that particularly from the 80s and 90s, and you can just look in the federal system and see the dramatic increase in the percentage of the number of defendants in the federal prison system who are drug defendants compared to what it was, say, you know, 50s, 60s, 70s. Um, and it's not just that they're being prosecuted, it's that the prison sentences are so long. Um, you know, it's one thing to send somebody to prison for two years for an offense. It's quite another thing to send them for 20 and 30 years, which with recidivism enhancements and mandatory minimums on the federal side is what you see. And there were similar recidivism enhancements and mandatory minimums in the state system where they would call them three strikes laws and mandatory minimums there. So I do believe that they're inextricably intertwined. Um, I don't think I would be someone who would be a, a proponent of decriminalization. Um, and I do think that there are other ways to address it. I think particularly where you're dealing with possession offenses in the state system, you don't do much of that in the federal system, but in the state system there are alternatives to incarceration um, that include treatment. We do some of that even in the federal system in drug courts where drug addiction has um, really been the source or the reason why they have, have committed other crimes as well. So I think there are alternatives to incarceration. We could do a whole lot better job even in the prison systems of drug treatment and providing that treatment when they come out of the prison system as well. And we could ensure more proportionate sentencing if someone is going to go to prison to ensure that their sentence actually fits the level of threat that they um, that they are to the safety of our communities. In the late 60s, I remember the government enacted the Narcotics Addict, Re the Narcotics Addict Rehabilitation Act, NARA, mm -hmm. which was meant to be a major step forward in this, and it just seems to have yeah. been blown away uh, in, the, in, the, in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But yeah, and you see that actually within the Bureau of Prisons as well. Believe it or not, in the 50s and 60s, there was a lot of work that was starting on rehabilitation. Um, in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but then when our prison population started exploding, that the money that they were spending on rehabilitation was then transferred over to building new prisons. And the money that they were spending on having people for prison education, and we have some folks here who had worked with me um, at DOJ when I was there on, on really totally revamping the education system in the Federal Bureau of Prisons, but the money that they were spending on education and programming um, that all got shifted over to sheer housing and the individual, the people, the experts in that, um, they had to shift over as well to guards, people who were doing more traditional security measures from a pure funding standpoint. And so it's a shame to me that we were actually more progressive in the 50s and 60s in that than we have been in the last couple of decades. Yes. <coughs> Sorry, uh, thanks for the talk. I wanted to ask, Talk a little bit more about um, what it was like prosecuting Eric Rudolph and uh, 
particularly with the media attention surrounding that case, uh, what that was like, and what you think about the cultural meaning of that case in hindsight, considering over the ensuing 20 years, there continued to be, you know, every couple of years, uh, say, a, a killing of an abortion doctor or a shooting at a Planned Parenthood clinic. Mm -hmm. um, well, that was definitely one of the most fascinating cases that I worked on during the time I was in AUSA. I actually started on that case um, early on, not long after the bombing, but after you all may have heard of Richard Jewell. He had originally been identified as the suspect there. I came onto the case after he was eliminated. We put a sort of new team in then. And so I was also on the case for all of those years that Eric Rudolph was on the run. Um, and there, you know, we had secured indictments, we had search warrants, we had done all of that, but we just didn't have the person to prosecute. And it wasn't until then, it was a local police officer who found him dumpster diving in Murphy, North Carolina at a Taco Bell. Um, a rather, you know, undignified way to be yeah, <laughs> captured after all of that time. Um, and actually the most challenging part of the Rudolph prosecution um, didn't really even have to do with the issue with respect to his targeting of an abortion clinic or a gay bar or even law enforcement, which is what he was really after in Centennial Park because he had a sucker bomb there to pull in law enforcement, the first responders, then with a second device to go off and kill them. It was what we found out after he was charged, and that is um, we knew that he had stolen a large cache of dynamite because we had figured out where the dynamite had most likely come from, and we were never able to find um, all of the rest of it that was missing. We found the dynamite that he had used, obviously, in his devices, but not all the dynamite that was missing. And a very long story short, I'll tell you, is that um, I got a call from his defense lawyer telling me that they would tell us where the dynamite is, but we would need to take the death penalty off the table if he would do that. And then as we went through more discussions, we learned that the dynamite was in fact buried in a national park that was used as a campground and that it had become so volatile over the years that it was there, our experts at FBI told us that like the Boy Scouts used this area all the time, that if they were, if they were pounding a tent stake into the ground and if it happened to be where the dynamite was, it would explode. And so we had the ethical quandary here of do we agree to take the death penalty off the table? Because putting aside where you are philosophically on the death penalty, um, sort of my view was, and putting aside where I philosophically was, if you're going to have one, he deserved it. Um, but do you then say you're going to put all of these people at risk then for years and years to come so that you have an opportunity to seek the death penalty here? And we went back and forth, and this was during uh, the Bush administration. We went back and forth on what we should do and ultimately determined that if he gave us the information we needed to be able to find the dynamite, if we could in fact find it, um, and he pled guilty to all of the bombings in Birmingham and in Atlanta, that we would take the death penalty off the table. And through a series of negotiations with his lawyer where he's got a topographical map and he's sitting there with Rudolph in his cell and is calling me saying, because it's not like you can say you go to this GPS point. I mean, he, it was, you find this big rock and you go around a corner and you look, and um, the agents were very, very leery because they believed it would be booby trapped. Um, because that had been Ted Kaczynski, who had been the Unabomber, that had been, you know, not too long before that. His cabin was booby trapped to the hilt. So they believed, given his feelings about law enforcement, that it would be booby trapped. Um, but again, I'm making a long story long now, um, that we, um, we were able to identify it. Um, it was too volatile to be moved at that point because it would detonate if they tried to move it. And so they detonated it in place and it made a crater much larger than this room. I mean, that's how much was there. And there was not only this dynamite, but a fully constructed device that was there um, as well, complete with shrapnel, et cetera. So, um, that was one of those difficult, they don't teach you in law school, what you do, you know, in that situation. Um, we teach them here, what do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, don't, I don't think I probably answered your question, but at least it, it was Rudolph related, so. Can I have one more question? Yes. 
I'm wondering if you had like similar qualms to what happened with the travel ban back in 2004 with the dismissal of U.S. attorneys for, I think it was refusing to uh, submit to Maine Justice's program on voter intimidation. I don't know if I'm speaking out of ignorance, there, but uh, I wonder if you had any thoughts about that issue when it came up. I'm sorry, 2004 I was in AUSA, so right. I probably I mean, wasn't very focused. Right, because attorneys were being Dismissed, I thought. They were in the Bush administration yeah. with the U.S. attorney firings. Yeah, yeah they did a big IG investigation about what that was over, and I'm not sure that it was specifically over that oh, one yes. issue. Um, but there were certainly questions about whether those decisions about firing those U.S. attorneys were purely based on performance or also on sort of philosophical views. Um, and that was quite controversial at the time. Um, and there was a lot of uproar over that then too, but but I was in AUSA and not really at Maine Justice, so frankly I was sort of focused on what was going on in Atlanta and tried to not even think about what was going on up in Washington. Yeah. Well, as you move forward in your careers, you may well encounter moments when uh, you will need to have integrity and courage to do the right thing. And I uh, urge you to remember uh, and not to forget the model um, of Sally Yates. Uh, she really is an American hero and a model for all lawyers in this country. So please join me in thanking her for joining us.